Hello guys, welcome back to Dr. His Academy. Today, we'll be discussing an important aspect of carbohydrate metabolism known as gluconeogenesis. Stay tuned. So gluconeogenesis is the formation of what new glucose molecules from other sources, all right? You can see the words gluco forward glucose new forward new and then genesis forward formation. So is the formation of what new glucose molecules from other sources. We can form our glucose from lactate say we use blood lactate to what form glucose right you can also form it from uh glycerol remember the glycerol is obtained from splitting of fats that's your triglyceride into what fatty acid and what glycerol all right we can also form it from what amino acids mind you not all amino acids can be used to obtain what glucose there's some that can be used known as what glucogenic amino acids all right so we have this Specifically, glucogenic ones, glucogenic amino acids. So, all the 20 amino acids you know about are glucogenic except two. All right, I'm sure you want to know the two. They are what? Lysine and what? The baby leucine. So, lysine and leucine are not what? Glucogenic. They are strictly what's ketogenic, so they can be used to form ketone bodies, all right? So when does gluconeogenesis occur? It occurs where in the liver and where the kidney. So these two organs undergo what gluconeogenesis to maintain a steady glucose level. You know, glucose is responsible for energy, especially in our RBC. You know, red blood cells depend solely on what glycolysis. So they need what glucose to obtain what energy, all right? They don't have mitochondria, so they don't undergo pyruvate dehydrogenation or pyruvate oxidation they don't undergo what Krebs cycle all right now the brain also requires glucose the brain is always working all right so it requires tons and tons of what glucose it can also use ketone bodies but well. it prevents glucose all right then we have some other tissues like our testes etc okay so cells that undergo glycolysis mainly okay as their sole or as their major source of what obtaining glucose requires steady supply of what glucose majorly cells that lack mitochondria or what have poor perfusion so our blood glucose is always maintained at what certain level by majorly the what liver and then later the what kidney okay how you know let's say two hours after we've eaten two hours post prandial right our level or our blood glucose is maintained at what 125 milligram per dl and then you can also use 7.0 millimole per liter, all right? Depending on which standard you use, okay? Now, three, four, five hours after we've eaten, what happens? The liver takes up what's your glycogen and splits it into what's glucose and releases it into the what? Blood, right? So we have another steady level maintained by what? The liver. And this is called what? Glycogenolysis. Okay, so glycogenolysis occurs to maintain another what level of what blood glucose. You can say this would be like about 100 milligram per day, right? Yeah. So after about six, seven, eight hours, what happens? Another steady level is obtained or maintained by what the liver, and this is called what gluconeogenesis. All right. So in this case, the liver starts, you know producing what glucose from other sources all right the liver majorly about 90 percent and then what the kidney so let's say the liver contributes 90 percent liver and then the kidney contributes about what 10 percent kidney then after about 12 hours what happens it now further drops a little still gluconeogenesis okay still gluconeogenesis but in this case your kidney now takes up what majority of the what gluconeogenesis all right yeah so these are liver let's say these are liver cell so a liver cell 
Now, if this is a liver, what transporter is this? What glucose transporter is this? Tell me glut 2. All right, we discussed this in the video on what glycolysis. I'll put the link in the description below. All right, so this would be our glut 2. And then let's recap what glycolysis because now we would what reverse the steps of what glycolysis for what gluconeogenesis. All right, it's pretty easy, right? You know, for glycolysis, glucose enters the cell. So we have our glucose being converted to what glucose 6 phosphate and then to what fructose 6 phosphate and then fructose 1 6 bisphosphate and then it was split by aldolase to what form dihydroacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which was converted to what 1 3 bisphosphoglycerate and then to 3 phosphoglycerate and then to what 2 phosphoglycerate and to what phosphoenol pyruvate and then what pyruvate. All right, so for gluconeogenesis, we want to reverse these steps backwards, all right, to form glucose, which we can now push into the blood, right? Now we'll go over gluconeogenesis from what pyruvate, all right? So once use pyruvate to form what glucose, all right? Then later, we we'll now see how we can incorporate these other sources, that's your lactates, your glycerol, and then your what? Amino acids into what? The pathway. Now for us to reverse these steps, we need to be conscious of what? The reversible and what? Irreversible steps. I told you that the irreversible steps are what? Steps one, steps three, and what? Ten. Okay, so these are the irreversible steps of what glycolysis. I illustrated them with what red. Then the green marker represents what the reversible steps. So you have your what two, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. All right. Now, for the irreversible steps, these give us what the roadblocks. All right. So these are the problems we have in what gluconeogenesis. If not, we could just reverse it. All right. But then we have to see how we can what circumvent these irreversible steps of what glycolysis. All right. Yeah. So the first roadblock is what this step ten. Or reaction 10 catalyzed by what pyruvate kinase all right so the conversion of what pyruvate to what phosphoenol pyruvate is not an easy one all right so the pyruvate kinase did the conversion for, from phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate in what's glycolysis but it cannot what reverse it okay so it's an irreversible reaction and is a what major load block so we have to what reverse it by what circumventing this step all right now how do we circumvent it we could easily circumvent it by what Converting pyruvate to what oxaloacetate, which is four carbon, okay, let's say, to oxaloacetate over here. And then from oxaloacetate to what phosphoenol pyruvate, okay? You know, this was your pyruvate kinase so this was a pyruvate kinase now for us to circumvent it from pyruvate we have to convert it to what oxaloacetate and then which can be converted to what phosphoenol pyruvate but it's not that easy all right because we don't have an enzyme in the cytoplasm which can convert pyruvate to what oxaloacetate it's not in the cytoplasm so this pyruvate has to journey its way down towards the mitochondria to be converted to what oxaloacetate and then the oxaloacetate has to come out and then be converted to what? Phosphoenol pyruvate. All right? Now let's illustrate these steps. So our pyruvate here, just like I said, has to journey its way down to where? The mitochondria. All right? The pyruvate comes into the mitochondria. Here's the pyruvate, right? In the pyruvate, what do you think can happen to this mitochondria? It can enter what? The oxidative pathway has to be converted to what? Acetyl CoA and then. Through the whole Krebs cycle, but this is not what we want right now. All right, so the pyruvate has to be converted towards oxaloacetate in the mitochondria. Oxaloacetate, all right. Now, this oxaloacetate is formed by this enzyme over here. This enzyme, okay, so these are orthopedic surgeon pyruvate carboxylase. All right. So pyruvate carboxylase, you can see it has something in its hand, a B, right? What's this B? It's what? The biotin. Okay, so it requires a coenzyme known as what? Biotin, right? So these are biotin required by what? Pyruvate carboxylase, all right? Cool. So this is the enzyme, this is coenzyme. And then you had pyruvate carboxylase. What comes to your mind? Ah, come on, the CO2. All right, so it uses what? A CO2. And then it uses something else. What? ATP. 
P. So it requires what's energy, right? And then we have our ADP over here, right? And our inorganic phosphates, definitely. Okay. So it's what's, you know, condensed CO2 with what pyruvates to form what oxaloacetate. You can see oxaloacetate is four carbon, pyruvate is what's three carbon, right? Yeah. So this oxaloacetate has to be what moved into the what's cytoplasm for what's conversion to what phosphoenone pyruvate, just like we discussed. All right. But now the oxaloacetate is trying, it cannot move. Why? Because there's no what transporter to transport it. This oxaloacetate has to be converted to something else that has what? A transporter, all right, that's that has a what mitochondrial transporter, and what's this mallet? Okay, so the oxalacetate will be converted to what mallet because we have what mallet transporters over here. So, mallet transporters, all right. Always remember the mitochondria, mitochondria have what mallet transporters all right so mallet transporter so your mitochondria has what mallet transporter so this oxalacetate has to be converted to what mallet in order to be shunted to where the cytoplasm right cool now this enzyme now the enzyme required is what mallet dehydrogenase all right you can check the video on Krebs cycle you see some of these enzymes you're talking about all right i'll put the link in the description below okay now this malate dehydrogenase converts oxaloacetate to what malate? What does it use? We had dehydrogenase, so you know somehow an NAD or NADH has to be used, right? So we have our Na. So we have our NADH being used to form what? NAD, right? Yeah. So, oxaloacetate was converted to what? Malate. And this malate journeys its way down to the cytosol. All right? Now, we have our malate in the cytoplasm. And the malate has come to the cytoplasm. What happens? It now has to be reconverted back to what? Oxaloacetate. All right? Now, this malate dehydrogenase is what mitochondrial malate dehydrogenase. The cytoplasm has its own malate dehydrogenase, all right? Yeah. So we have another malate dehydrogenase found in the what? Cytoplasm, all right? So we are doing the reverse reaction of what we did previously in the mitochondria. And now we use what? NAD plus to form what? NAD. H. All right. Yeah. So we now have our what? Oxaloacetate over here. Oxaloacetate. Come on, the man we've been looking for, right? And then the oxaloacetate will now be converted to what? Phosphoenol pyruvate. So these are phosphoenol pyruvate. And what's this enzyme that converts oxaloacetate into phosphoenol pyruvate? Can you guess? Pyruvate carboxykinase. All right. So this is our what? Pyruvate carboxy kinase. All right. So this pyruvate carboxy kinase converts oxaloacetate to what phosphoenol pyruvate. Yeah. And then what happens? It yanks off what the CO two. So the CO two goes off. Yeah. And then it requires what GTP. You know previously the carboxylase pyruvate carboxylase used what. ATP. This one is using what GTP. This is what GTP, and then you know we have our what GDP. All right, cool. Now we formed that what phosphoenol pyruvate. Pretty easy, right? Yeah. So we formed our phosphoenol pyruvate. What happens? The reverse. What you already know from glycolysis, right? So the reverse reaction starts occurring, right? Phosphoenol pyruvate is converted to what? Two phosphoglycerate, which is converted to what? Three phosphoglycerate, which is converted to what? One three bisphosphoglycerate, which is converted to what? Glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Glyceraldehyde three phosphate can now be converted to what? Fructose one six what? Bisphosphate. Fructose one six bisphosphate has to be converted to fructose six phosphate. But come on, the reaction is what? Irreversible. So the enzyme says, oh no, I cannot do this. I cannot go back. All right. Now let me clean this over here. We want to reverse 
this reaction, but another enzyme comes into play. You know, this was our what? Phosphofructokinase 1, which did this reaction. So this was our phosphofructokinase 1. Now, for us to do the reverse reaction, we have to check around in the cytoplasm for what an enzyme known as what? Fructose 1, 6, what? Bisphosphatase. All right? And what does this fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase do? It carries fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and then it yanks off what? A phosphate to form what are fructose 6-phosphate. All right? Yeah, cool. Now, the fructose 6-phosphate can be converted to what? Glucose 6-phosphate. The reaction is reversible, right? And then another roadblock, the third roadblock in this reaction, converting what? Glucose 6-phosphate to what? Glucose. Wow. What do we need? I'm sure you tell me what a glucose 6-phosphate is, just like this other one, you know? And yeah, we need a glucose 6-phosphate. But guess what? There is no what? Cytoplasmic enzyme like what glucose 6-phosphate is. That's a problem because, you know, we need another guy here known as what? The smooth endoplasmic reticulum. You know, earlier we needed what? The mitochondria. Now we need what? The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, all right? Yeah. So this glucose 6-phosphate journeys this way. Come on. So many journeys. For one reaction, all right. So the glucose 6-phosphate journeys this way to where the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, all right. In the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, there's a transporter which has to what carry it in. This transporter is a complex one, right? So it has what three units or three subarms: one, two, and three, all right. So this is a what glucose 6-phosphate what translocase, all right. That's the transporter. Glucose 6-phosphate what trans Locus. All right? So this glucose 6 phosphate translocase has what? T1, T2, and what? T3. Right? So these are T1. T1 is what? For glucose 6 phosphate itself. Right? So the glucose 6 phosphate crosses what? Through T1 into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. All right? So we have a glucose 6 phosphate entering here. And then it crosses through this enzyme. This enzyme splits it into what? Glucose, all right? And what? Phosphate. So these are glucose over here, and these are what? Inorganic phosphate. So the enzyme splits it into glucose and what? Inorganic phosphate. What's the name of this enzyme? Tell me glucose 6 phosphate is because it's the yanks of what? A phosphate. So the name of this enzyme is what? Glucose. Glucose 6 Phosphatase. All right. So this glucose cis phosphate is yanks of what the phosphate from glucose cis phosphate one was a glucose and what an inorganic phosphate. Right. Now this glucose has to leave where it has to leave the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So it passes through this same transporter. All right. So this translocase. So this was translocase two. So T two and T two carries what our glucose. Then the inorganic phosphate also has to live, and it lives through where this same transporter. So the T3 carries what are phosphates, all right? So it carries the phosphates, all right? That's cool, right? So we have T1 for what glucose is phosphate. We have T2 for what glucose, and we have what T3 for what inorganic phosphates, right? Now, the glucose comes out through here, and we have our what? Glucose. So the glucose can now live through what? The glute transporter, right? Through the glute 2 transporter into where? The blood, all right? Yeah, so we formed our what? Glucose molecules. Now let's talk about lactate, glycerol, and what? Amino acids briefly. So the first one we'll be talking about is what? are glycerol, right? So let's discuss glycerol first. This is what a fat cell. So let's say these are what? Adipocytes. Adipocytes. Okay, yeah, that's our fat cell, right? And now in the fat cell, what do you expect? You see what? Triglyceride or triacyl glycerol, however you call it, all right? So these are what? Triglyceride. And the triglyceride has to be broken down to form what? Fatty acids, that's correct. And what? Glycerol. 
That's this our glycerol. And then let's say these are what? Fatty acids. Alright, so let's say this these are what? Fatty acids. Right? So we have the what? Glycerol. And then we have what? Fatty acids. Alright? Now this glycerol would be what? Moved into the blood. Right? To be mopped up by where? The liver. Alright? So we have our glycerol here. Glycerol. And then the glycerol enters where? The liver. Through this transporter. What's this transporter called? This transporter is what? Our aquaporin 9. Alright? So that's our aquaporin 9. Alright? Aquaporins are not just for water, right? Yeah. So these are what? Aquaporin 9. And then the glycerol enters the liver, right? Yeah. And then the glycerol, when it enters the liver, to be converted what? By glycerol kinase, right? To what? Glycerol phosphates, right? I'm sure you heard the kinase, so you expect what? ATP to be used, and then to give out what? ADP. And then a phosphate is attached to what? Glycerol, okay? So the glycerol kinase takes up glycerol, and then you know, attaches the phosphates to form of glycerol phosphate, right? Now, this glycerol phosphate would then be converted to what? This is our boy over here. So now you see we've moved it into what? The glycolytic pathway, right? So the genesis can continue, right? So this glycerol phosphate is converted to what? Dihydroacetone phosphate. Dihydroacetone phosphate. So this is an intermediate in glycolysis, right? So this glycerol phosphate was converted by an enzyme. What's the name of this enzyme? Can you guess? The name of this enzyme is what? Glycerol phosphate what? Dehydrogenase. All right? So glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase converts glycerol phosphate to what? Dihydroacetone phosphate. And then the dihydroacetone phosphate can now, you know, be converted to what? Well, to one cis bisphosphate because you can see that it's a what? Reversible reaction. All right, so this is a reversible reaction. So the hydroacetone phosphate is converted to what? Fructose one cis bisphosphate, and then the rest of the reaction continues backwards, right? Yeah, with the fructose one cis bisphosphate is coming into play, and then the glucose six phosphate is from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, right? That's pretty easy, right? Yeah. So let's talk about what lactates. Then we've already discussed what glycerol. Now let's talk about lactates. So these are skeletal muscle. This is these are exercising skeletal muscle. Pyruvate has to be converted to what? Lactate. Lactate. All right? Why should it be converted to lactate? You can check the video on glycolysis. We talked about it. Where pyruvate has to be converted to lactate by what? Lactate dehydrogenase. So lactate dehydrogenase. In order to free up what? NAD. Okay, so NADH. Our NADH is converted to what? NAD. All right, so this NAD can now go back towards glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase and be used to form what 1 3 bisphosphoglycerate. All right, so this NAD has to be freed up, right? And then the lactate is now mocked up to where the blood. So we have our lactate entering where the liver, right? So in the liver, the lactate has to be converted to what. Pyruvate, all right. So the reverse reaction occurs as here, right? So here, pyruvate was converted to lactate. Lactate was now what's taken to the blood and then it was mopped up by where? The liver. So this lactate that is mopped up by the liver has to be converted to what? Pyruvate. And then it now goes into what? The reaction, all right? So this pyruvate now goes down, all right, to where? To pyruvate over here. And then the rest of gluconeogenesis occurs as discussed, right? You know, we discussed from pyruvate to glucose. So that's the same thing that occurs, right? Yeah. So let's now talk about what? The amino acids. So the amino acids in the blood, so this is your blood, blood amino acid pool, right? So the blood amino acid pool is mopped up by where? The liver. So we have our amino acid over here. And then this amino acid, reacts with what? A keto acid. To dump an amino group onto the keto acid, right? 
So the an amino group is carried on to this keto acid to form what a new amino acid, right? So we form a new amino acid and then form what a new keto acid. That can now enter where the TCA cycle. So this new keto acid can enter where the TCA cycle to form an intermediate in what TCA cycle. And then let's say it forms oxaloacetate eventually or forms malate, which now leads to what continue with what the gluconeogenesis, right? So let's give an example. Say your alanine reacting with what alpha keto glutarate. To form what? Glutamate and what? Pyruvate, all right? So pyruvate is now formed and this pyruvate can enter where? The gluconeogenesis. So sometimes you can see the amino acid using, being used to form what? Pyruvate, you can see them being used to form what? An intermediate in what? TCA cycle. Right, which eventually is used to form what maybe oxalacetate or malate can that can now be shunted to what cytoplasm to continue what gluconeogenesis. All right, yeah. Now let's talk about what can go wrong in this what pathway or in this gluconeogenesis reaction. All right, so we could have enzyme deficiencies. You know, we've talked about the major enzyme being what the pyruvate carboxylase, pyruvate carboxykinase, fructose one cis bisphosphatase, and what glucose six. Phosphatase. So these enzymes, any of these enzymes could be what deficient. If the enzyme is deficient, what do you expect? One, you expect what hypoglycemia, right? So let me clean this. You expect what hypoglycemia from an enzyme what deficiency. So any of the enzymes that is deficient, you would see what hypoglycemia. I'm sure you you know why. So this gluconeogenesis forms what glucose molecules, and then when it cannot form glucose molecules, what happens? The blood glucose goes down. Okay. So in this patient, we want these patients to eat what regularly, right? Because they cannot maintain blood glucose with what gluconeogenesis. All right. So you don't want them to fast or starve, right? Yeah. Then another condition you can see is what lactic acidosis. Lactic acidosis. So in these patients. You know that lactic acid is being produced regularly. I illustrated it over here with the skeletal muscle, right? So apart from the skeletal muscle, there's something else, your RBCs, which are constantly, so your red blood cells are constantly what? Producing lactate. So they are constantly, you know, spilling lactate into the blood. Why? Because they undergo only what? Glycolysis, right? So they, they don't undergo any other form of you know, carbohydrate metabolism or carbohydrate breakdown, except for glycolysis, right? Okay. So the red blood cells are always constantly spinning what lactate into the blood, right? So we have our lactate over here being spilled always by the RBCs. So this lactate now has to enter the blood and then if gluconeogenesis can occur, the liver cell pops up this lactate to form what glucose. Okay, to spill into the blood back. But if it cannot occur, what would you see? Lactic acidosis. All right? Yeah. So when you have lactic acidosis, what do you expect? There's high what lactic acid in the blood, right? And then in the kidney, the proximal convoluted tubule, we have something over here. This is called what? Urate 1. Okay. So it's a transporter called what? Urate 1. Among the family of what? organic anion transporter okay so this urate one what does it do it transports blood lactates in exchange for what uric acid so it transports lactates and brings in what uric acid right so when you have excess lactic acid what do you expect Excess lactic acid is being, you know, shunted into what the nephron, and then excess uric acid is being what brought into the blood. All right. So you have what, in addition to the lactic acidosis, the patient will have what hyperuricemia. Okay, hyperuricemia. All right. So apart from all these enzyme deficiencies, that's your pyruvate carboxylase, 
pyruvate carboxykinase, your fructose 1 6 bisphosphatase, and your what? Glucose 6 phosphatase. What else can go wrong? This is translocase over here. All right, so we could have an, a problem with this translocase. So the translocase could maybe be deficient or it could not, it might not be present, you know, in the individual. All right, now I'm sure some of you have heard of what von Gieck's disease. Von Gieck. So it's an, this is von Gieck's disease. So it's a glycogen storage disease. We talk about when we are discussing what glycogen metabolism. All right, but let me just hint you small. In von Gieck's disease, the glucose 6 phosphate is could be absent. So that's von Gieck type 1A, right? And then apart from that, it could be what translocase 1, that's what's absent, okay? So that's type 1B, and then it could be translocase 2, and that's what's type 1C, and then it could be what translocase 3, that's absent, and that'll be what type 1D, all right? So von Gieck type 1A, for what glucose 6 phosphate is deficiency. Type 1B is for deficiency in translocase 1. Type 1C, deficiency in what translocase 2. And then type 1D, deficiency in what 3 or any anomaly in any of these. All right? Yeah. So, in any of these von Gieck's disease or other enzyme deficiencies, we would still expect what these classical symptoms, right? That's, that's your hypoglycemia, fasting hypoglycemia, your lactic acidosis, and your what? hyperuricemia right so guys we've come to the end of this beautiful lecture i'm sure you enjoyed it do well to subscribe put your comments below give us a thumbs up and then share to your friends so they can benefit from this lecture thank you and see you in the next lecture